You're listening to ThoughtCast. I'm Jenny Atiyah, and I'm at the New England Aquarium in Boston, which in addition to housing an abundance of marine life, is also home to a group of prominent research scientists, including a coral reef ecologist. Randy Rogen, welcome to ThoughtCast. Why coral? What drew you to this particular organism? Corals are really unusual organisms, and that is part of their appeal to me. What I love about corals is they're a little bit of everything. Corals are animals, but they also harbor tiny little dinoflagellates, which are plant-like algae that live inside the animal cells. And so they're sort of animal and plant all combined into one. So that's really what I love so much about corals. Plus, they're beautiful. They're critically important for building coral reef ecosystems, which couldn't exist without the corals, and I just find them captivating. I believe one of the reasons you're studying coral is that they're ecosystem engineers, which are organisms that have a disproportionate impact on their habitat. How does coral do this? Well, as I said, they are sort of plant and animal at the same time, but they're also mineral. They also, um, at least hard corals, uh, produce hard calcareous skeletons behind them. And so they're ecosystem engineers because they are creating coral reef habitats. Uh, the same way trees really create the forests, corals really create coral reefs. So if you didn't have corals creating uh, reef habitats with all of their skeleton, you would have no place for fish to hide, you'd have no nooks and crannies, you'd actually have no structural complexity to the ecosystem at all. So the corals are really what are creating all of the habitat on which all of the other organisms depend. And that, to me, is what makes them ecosystem engineers. They're the engineers, they're the architects, they're the construction workers, they do everything. But in addition to having a profound impact on their habitat, doesn't the habitat also have a profound impact on coral? It does, and um, that's one of the things that I try to work on and try to study. Um, corals are, uh, for as sturdy as they may seem with their hard calcareous skeletons, they actually are relatively fragile organisms that live within a very narrow range of temperature and other climatic conditions um, that they need to thrive. And when any of those things are threatened, for example, temperature or water clarity or sedimentation, corals um, really can't survive outside of that narrow band of climatic conditions. And so the habitat around coral can actually really make a difference into whether corals um, can survive there or not. Could coral be described as the canary in the coal mine? Many people think that corals are in, in many ways canaries in a coal mine because they can be so sensitive to climatic changes. And in fact, that's I think what we're seeing now. You know, corals have unfortunately suffered major losses globally, worldwide. And uh, they're one of the first ecosystems to show such dramatic change in response to what we've done on a global scale to the planet. What is happening to coral as a result of the human impact, the degradation of the environment? Well, corals are, unfortunately, they're suffering from just so many different problems. Um, it's what I like to call death by a thousand cuts. For example, are they suffering from pollution? And if it's pollution, is it pollution because of nutrients? If there's too many nutrients, are they from farmland or is it from raw sewage? Is it chemical pollution? Is there overfishing that's going on? Is there too much coral disease? And so all of these things are impacting uh, near shore coral reefs. But in some of the most remote places in the planet, for example, the Phoenix Islands, which is where I've been working recently, we have a chance to look at what's impacting coral reefs only on a global scale. The Phoenix Islands are actually a thousand miles away from anywhere, truly. They're a thousand miles away from Fiji, and it's a small group of islands. There are eight islands, actually, total, only one of which is inhabited with 31 people. So this is an uninhabited place, and it was a stunning ecosystem, but unfortunately it suffered recently from some global effects, and we are able to study uh, exactly how things are changing on a global scale in places like the Phoenix Islands where there's really no regular local impact on a daily basis. So if you take into consideration the recent change in the Phoenix Islands, which I believe is from overheated water? That's right. And what happened in the Phoenix Islands was in 2002-2003, there was what we call a catastrophic bleaching event, um, which was caused by a high temperature event in the water. So was tiny plant-like algae that were living inside the cells, they died. And they are super important for corals because just like plants, they're photosynthesizing and using the sunlight's energy to basically give some food to the corals. And so when the algae died, the corals died because they couldn't basically create enough food. They starved to death. But their structure remained. So the, the standing dead graveyards of corals, they were shadows of their former selves, just standing dead. However, I was really privileged to be there in 2009 
when the rebuilding had already begun. And these corals, remarkably so, were well on their way to recovery. Uh, this is actually one of the fastest documented recoveries in coral reef history. Um, we think it's because of their remoteness. Nonetheless, the coral in the Phoenix Islands is experiencing an interesting phenomenon which you have studied, which I believe has to do with fish eating the coral. I really care about fish-coral interactions. And um, what I think is really, really interesting is the same, some of the same fish which are considered to be critically important herbivores, which eat algae, which would otherwise smother corals. So these guys as herbivores are really important for maintaining healthy coral reefs. Um, some of them also eat live coral. And that's not necessarily a good thing or a bad thing, but um, it's certainly interesting and nobody knows why they do it. Why are they eating this coral and not that coral? And, and you know, those are the sorts of dynamics that I try to understand. And in the Phoenix Islands, where we have not a lot of overfishing and we have some of the largest and most intact fish populations anywhere on the planet still, that's one of the nicest um, systems for studying coral livery, which is the word I use to describe how fish eat live coral. Coral livery. Yep. Eating coral. Absolutely. That's exactly right. Just, just checking. Yep. <laughs> what do the coral do when they're being eaten? Do they have a defense mechanism? Well, um, once they're being eaten, there's not much they can do. Um, and there are certain fish which are immune, we think, to any defense that corals may have. But certainly corals do have some defenses. They have their hard calcareous skeleton, which is very hard for some fish to bite into. And then their polyps actually have nematocysts, which are tiny stinging cells, so they can sting that way. And they are likely to also harbor chemical defenses, but there are certainly fish which don't seem to care about any of those and can go ahead and eat live coral. Do coral ever eat fish? Not that I've seen. <laughs> <laughs> but I can show you what coral livery looks like. Do you want to see it? Oh, sure. Oh, this is really cool. So this is a hard calcareous skeleton of a coral, and what you can see here are little scrape marks made by a parrotfish and a live coral, and you can actually see um, the grazing scars. It's really, really cool. So this is a Parodes asteroides coral, and it was taken from the Caribbean, and uh, there's a specific parrotfish, Sparisoma viridae, or the stoplight parrotfish, which was grazing live coral uh, tissue. So it was a coralivore, and you can see evidence of its coral livery uh, by looking at the grazing scars and all of the, you can actually see the distinct groove marks from uh, the teeth uh, right there on the coral in between the polyp. Randy, you also have a research interest in hermit crabs, which live in the abandoned shells of sea snails because they don't have shells of their own. Why are these crabs significant? These crabs are fascinating. We study their shell exchange and shell behavioral dynamics because we think they're absolutely fascinating um, on their own level, but they're also significant because there are so many parallels between the way these crabs switch shells and the way humans switch resources like homes or jobs or anything else that um, is a discrete, limited, and reusable resource. One of the pleasures of preparing for this interview, Randy, was coming across research papers you've written with titles <laughs> like Social Context of Shell Acquisition in Cenobita Clypeatus Hermit Crabs. What is the social context here? Well, the great thing about hermit crabs and the way they switch shells is that they often do this in groups, um, and that's the social context. We actually think of this as social networking for hermit crabs. In nature, what we often see are many, many crabs all competing for a single shell. And this is a really interesting situation because they're crabs. They're crabby. They squabble. They bite. And what they do in some cases, uh, the case of Cenobita clypeatus, is there's an empty shell and a couple of crabs will investigate it. And by investigate it, they'll turn it over and look at the outside. They'll actually stick their chelipad or their major claw into the inside of the shell. And once they've determined that it's empty and that it's suitable, they will try to switch in which works if you're the only crab in line. But if there's multiple crabs waiting to get in and they're all similarly sized, they will start to fight. And if there are multiple sized crabs, they will actually start assembling in line because for every single crab that you have, you have another possible shell. So when one crab switches into this shell, you'll have a new vacant shell that's empty. So crabs will assemble into line 
and fight and fight and fight for it for hours about where they want to be in line. And they almost line up into, it's actually almost perfect size order. And then what happens in some cases, in what we call synchronous vacancy chains, you will see after hours of assembling themselves into line, you will see simultaneous switches that move just like dominoes all the way down, where within five seconds you can get up to 10 or 15 shell switches as crabs um, move themselves down the line. It's really, it's quite remarkable. Have you seen this happen? I have. It's pretty incredible. And um, it gets more complicated than just that. Uh, if you have enough crabs um, around a single empty shell, you, you, we get what we call tug of war chains, where you have multiple chains forming off of a single empty shell, and they're sort of competing for access to this. Or sometimes you have a whole lot of small, small, small crabs that are waiting by a shell that's too large, and we call those waiters. And we think that they're waiting until a larger crab comes along, which can serve as the catalyst for the progression of these chains. And, so. Unbelievable. It's pretty um, amazing. Is there ever a shell that's not empty yet that a hermit crab might want? Yes, and um, they do evict each other on occasion, and they usually do this based on a, a series of rules. Um, one crab is larger than a crab inhabiting a shell, and, um, and rather than fight, they communicate with what we call honest signals, and it's not really worth it for a smaller crab to get into a fight with a larger crab, so he will vacate the shell and allow the larger crab to come in. won't do this easily, but we can see evictions in nature, and they're often based on either a size discrepancy or a motivation discrepancy. What about a shell that still has the sea snail in it? Sea snails are pretty good at defending their own shells and uh, sort of tucking themselves in. And uh, while there is certainly snail on snail predation and there's plenty of things that cause death of sea snails, um, I have yet to see a hermit crab do that in the wild. Randy, I can't let this interview end without asking you about the ecology of deep sea hydrothermal vents. These are hardly inviting habitats and yet you've studied tube worms that seem to thrive there. Actually, I've studied the bacteria that live in tube worms that seem to thrive there, and that <laughs> is the key. <laughs> These tube worms would be nothing without their bacteria. Instead of photosynthesis, what happens with tube worms is there is chemosynthesis, where symbiotic bacteria are using energy coming up from the earth all of the hydrogen sulfide that is being leaked by these vents, basically, and they are fixing carbon from that. So they're unlike almost every ecosystem that you're familiar with on the surface, um, which is using, in some way, shape, or form, sunlight. That's not the case in deep sea vents. It's all chemosynthesis, and um, these worms have no mouth and no gut. They All of their energy is coming directly from their bacteria. But aren't these hydrothermal vents fissures in the ocean floor that spew out molten rock and poisonous gases. How do these worms survive in such temperatures? Well, there are definitely temperature gradients. They're not always at the, the hottest place. Um, in fact, you can actually sort of see a gradient of life. And worms live near the hot vents, but not at the hottest point. So they do absolutely have sort of an optimal temperature range where they thrive. But all of those molten toxic gases that you're, you're talking about are actually the chemical energy source that the bacteria use to help these worms to thrive. So they depend on it. They need it. For them, that's you know sweet, sweet nectar of life to each their own. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Randy Rogen, thank you very much for your time. Oh, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. You've been listening to Randy Rogen, a coral reef research scientist at the New England Aquarium on ThoughtCast. I'm Jenny Atia. Thanks for joining us.